Thank you, uh, Annie. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's great to see you um, this morning. Uh, you have seen already, um, yeah, these two hashtags that I put there as an example of feminist uh, uh, mobilizations online. Maybe one of you, is everything fine with the translation? I can give you half a minute. You follow me? Okay. Uh, maybe one of you would like to just give me an example, like what is the commonalities between Taharosh and Me Too? Who knows Taharosh, the hashtag Taharosh? Who has heard of it? Who has seen it? Okay, I have one here in the back. Second, okay. So we start with you and then we come to you, okay? Over there. Right there, yes. Yeah. al khair, ana akthar عن هاشتاج مي تو مش قادرة أتذكر مين بلشوا بس أعتقد هم ممثلات من هوليوود كانوا بيحكوا عن التحرش اللي عم بيتعرضوا له في بداية الشغل تبعهم في هوليوود وبعدها كثير من النساء صارت تحكي مي تو بمعنى أنا أيضا تعرضت للتحرش فطلع هذا الوسم بكثير مناطق بالعالم وحتى في الوطن العربي تم استخدامه Yeah, you mentioned Hollywood, like as the main producer also of, uh, of media, right? Uh, movies that are very influential. Okay, I have a second question here, and then I come to you. صباح الورد. هو أنا زم نفس ما حكت زميلتي ربا. أنا بعرف بس عن هاشتاج ميتو اللي هو أطلقته واحدة من الممثلات اللي كانت متعرضة لتحرش من قبل المنتج وبعدين. سبقوا بعدين تبعوها كل الممثلات أساس ميتو إنه أنا أيضا تعرضت للتحرش ومن حملة تشجيعية إنه لكل اللي تعرضوا إنهم يكشفوا مين هالمتحرش ويعرضوا يعني إنه يكشفوا حقيقته للعالم. Thank you. Yes, uh, one last here. Maybe also about Taharush, like nobody knows that happened. صباح الخير. الحمد لله هي انطقتها الممثلة الأمريكية أليس ميلون وهي مثلت انتفاضة للنساء ضد التحرش على تويتر تحديدا والهاشتاج يعني لقى أصداء عالمي ووصل لأرقام مليونية بالتغريدات حول الموضوع وتم فتح العديد من قضايا التحرش حول العالم من خلال هذا الهاشتاج شكرا لك Like from your um, media consumption and knowledge, is there any other hashtags that you know that go a bit in that same direction? Calling out harassment, sexual harassment on an everyday basis. Looking at the German group, for example. <laughs> Anyone? <laughs> okay. Um, Uh, actually, there is, a, there is a long hashtag her story already. Um, we are all women has been a hashtag uh, with like more or less the same intentions from the US. <coughs> Aufschrei is a very <coughs> famous example from the German context. Uh, it uh, translates as outcry. It has been launched in 2015, like a couple of years ago. Moi aussi j'ai été violentée. That is like a French speaking uh, hashtag from Tunisia that like also never kicked off in the way that uh, Me Too has, but it existed as well and it had the same intentions. Uh, Taharush, yeah, comes from the Egyptian context. Uh, I think we don't have Egyptians here today, right? I think last year there. Um, uh, Mishbasita is uh, what I've learned here in Lebanon, uh, a similar uh, feminist hashtag. And yeah, now I'm, I'm closing this hashtag history with Me Too, also just to show that Maybe that's the hashtag that we know most about or that has like uh, produced then a lot of uh, knowledge creation around 
the issue of feminist mobilization online, but there have been hashtags before like with, with more or less the same intention. Women, as you already mentioned, speaking out against uh, sexual harassment and finding this commonality there. So what do feminist hashtags got to do with uh, media literacy? Are there any comments? Does anybody want to say something about that? I have one hand here. <laughs> you two want to make the lecture with me? <laughs> okay, first here and then there. Yes. هي تعتبر يعني من أصل وأهم أصول التربية الإعلامية توعية الناس توعية المجتمع بأنه إحنا بنعرف إنه هذا تحرش هو إعلان للمرأة بوعيها بأنه هذا تحرش توعية بقية النساء بأنه ما يقبلوا بأنهم يتعرضوا للتحرش يسكتوا عن حقهم يعني توعية المرأة بالتعبير عن حقها وبرضه كمان توعية للمجتمع بأنه هاي ظاهرة موجودة وبالتالي لابد إنه المجتمع يكون مسؤول عن إيقافها Yes, creating knowledge, raising awareness. هي معظم الإعلام كثير actually بساهم بشكل المرأة وكيف بيتم تقديمها وكيف حتى التعاطي معها بالشارع يعني الصورة اللي بتعطيه بالإعلام رح ينتقل للشارع فأحد الأمثلة خلينا نحكي التحرش أو مثلا النظر للإمرأة ككائن جنسي وليس كائن له كيانه كائن عقلاني كائن قادر على العمل يعني مثلا من خلال الدعاية والإعلام فالإعلام بشكل أو بآخر مش بس المجتمع هو متواطئ مع المجتمع في كتير أوقات أو حتى بقيد المجتمع لأماكن إنه يتم التعاطي مع المرأة وقضاياها كأنها شخص أقل أو بيأثر على المجتمع نفسه بحيث يتم التعاطي مع المرأة كأنها بمرتبة أدنى أو في مكان معين Yeah, you're mentioning the, uh, the mass media also in, and their role in reproducing uh, stereotypes. And I think, yeah, both is true. Like when we get back to the more uh, a definition of media literacy, I think there are really multiple layers that you can uh, analyze uh, feminist hashtags with. Um, on the one hand, you have access and create. Uh, we can speak about the digital empowerment and the stories of the many. So this is like really a... Uh, we're not talking about a mass media where one producer is producing the images, but it's like many stories, it's many normal women um, that uh, explain uh, or, or just uh, call out behavior that they encounter in their everyday life. Um, and these stories of the many actually reveal patterns and hereby a structure of oppression. So, and this year, 2019, this uh, media literacy also wants to go more deeper into this question of how do media empower also the, the group of the oppressed um, or oppressed groups. I think this is a, a very good example also on how you can, um, what you said, also create knowledge around what actually means sexual harassment, where does it start, um, what are the, ex the different experiences? And on the other hand, you have analyze and evaluate what you also mentioned, like you uh, become able also of uh, decoding sexism in the mass media. I, there were more, there was also um, trending around these hashtags, uh, more awareness or calling out um, mass media representations um, that would somehow also reproduce sexist images. Um, it enables, and this is also a Thanks to Professor Tanya, we discussed this. It actually also enables um, a reflected participation. So this, got, this is also what we want to do, or like what media literacy may be about, um, um, giving knowledge to oppressed groups about how they can participate in a more meaningful way. And I think especially in the um, in context of uh, um, participation of women in the uh, digital public sphere, it's very important that they, for example, also protect themselves when it comes to uh, uh, digital harassment. This is also something that was like long time ignored, um, also in research uh, and not being considered as actually a form of violence, but it is. Uh, so it's also important to um, always reflect uh, of, uh, about being safe uh, when speaking and when participating in um, this kind of uh, actions. 
And finally, it's also the interactions between hashtags and their reception in the mass media and, uh, as you know, I'm a political scientist, also the political system. So this is also the question, how does it actually influence um, um, uh, politics? And this is something where I would like to go to at the end of my uh, talk. So the content, uh, first of all, I would like to discuss with you some uh, concepts and definitions. I've been working a lot with public sphere theory and with intersectional theory. Uh, I will not go too much into detail there, but I think it's always also helpful to just see a little bit, have a bit of theoretical background theory. Um, then I go to analyzing hashtags and intersectional oppressions. This is just one, uh, one tool that you could use. Um, then what I'm very interested in uh, is this uh, spillover from hashtag publics to the mainstream or mainstream media uh, and these interactions. Um, and yeah, at the end, I, as I said, uh, we talk about some, some impacts and see what are the results actually of this kind of mobilization. Or are there any? Yeah, this is just to refer to uh, myself. My, I actually come from uh, studying um, the uprisings in Tunisia, uh, where I've been working before uh, the, the revolution, and then we all got like caught in this spirit, and uh, from the first time also saw how on and offline activism and on and offline uh, mobilization can function, right, in 2010, 2011. Um, and then this was just a, a development, uh, but originally I come really from this idea of activism between on and offline, how can you organize? Uh, uh, online and how does that get visibility also in the street and the demonstrations and so on. So as uh, promised, concepts and definitions. Um, first, um, yeah, when you speak about the public sphere, at least in the in the Western context or in the Western uh, no, um, knowledge production in academia, um, you have to talk about uh, Jürgen Habermas. Um, who is very famous. Uh, I don't know who knows Jürgen Habermas here from the public? <laughs> the German group here, okay. Uh, yeah, so uh, he like um, can be considered like the, the, the father of deliberative democratic uh, democrat, uh, theory um, and he considers like the public sphere as a network, network for the communication of opinions and standpoints generating public opinion. Um, he like uh, wrote his habilitation in, uh, by the beginning of the 1960s and since then everybody who somehow works on public sphere theory needs to mention him because uh, he's like uh, the, the, the first. Um, however, he um, made uh, a, a couple of mistakes that he also revised and he got some interesting critique. And this is also, I just show you this because um, these, these theoreticians really thought about uh, our society and also our mediated society and how it can uh, look like. Um, and it's also important to also always ask, okay, who is actually writing these theories? So Habermas has been criticized, uh, for instance, by Nancy Fraser very prominently, um, who wrote uh, Rethinking the Public Sphere in the, uh, in the 90s then. And she says, Habermas actually says, public sphere, in the, in the ideal world of the public sphere, um, people come together, leave aside their differences, and just discuss rationally what is best for the society. This is like the, the ideal world. Um, and she came, she said, okay, uh, this is not going to happen because you have to actually unbracket the inequalities because we are all, we have been raised differently, we have different knowledge, we have been socialized. Uh, in, a, in a different way, according to our gender, according to our economic resources, according to our uh, education. So in, a, in an argument, in a space where we should all just sit together and the best argument would win, the best argument will be given by those who, have the most, who are most powerful, who have the best education, who have, uh, who have had this, these resources. It's practically it's, um, impossible to uh, create this kind of utopian space where we are all equal. Okay, so uh, he kind of uh, neglected the, power, the real power relations in our society. And Nancy Fraser uh, has also been criticized uh, recently now by, uh, in 2002, for example, um, also by black uh, feminist theoreticians, where, uh, for 
example, this is a rethinking the black public sphere. As you see, it's always a rethinking, a rethinking. And um, uh, here, the main um, um, argument is also that uh, the different publics should, and, or and subaltern and, and count counter publics should always also be looked at by their different resources. Um, I can go into that. Uh, uh, with you later individually, because I think this goes now a little bit too far. What I just want to show is how also theory develops and develops more and more by those who actually access academia, just like, for example, for at first women access academia, or also in the Western, uh, very much uh, white Western academic system, uh, where when people of color um, enter and also bring their experience and challenge the already existing knowledge. So it's about challenging knowledge um, that you do in the academic context, um, but also in the media. So um, I will just now come to um, the theory of uh, Nancy Fraser that I mentioned first uh, earlier um, and her theory of counterpublics. So uh, she defines counterpublics as who has heard about uh, counterpublics? I think sometimes you, you hear it, but you're not really sure what... Okay, so you're familiar with the concept. Um, I find it very helpful to analyze, uh, for example, a um, feminist uh, mobilization or any mobilization online by oppressed groups, right? So for instance, also in Tunisia, uh, at the beginning, those who were showing images of uh, state violence and so on, that was, you could also say, okay, this is a kind of a counter public that has been formatted um, challenging the hegemonic discourse, which was very much of everything is fine in Tunisia um, before in 2010. Um, so counter publics are defined as parallel discursive arenas where members of subordinated social groups invent and circulate counter discourses, which in turn permit them to formulate oppositional interpretations of their identities, interests, and needs. Um, I find it also interesting to uh, just point out another model of the public sphere with which I'm working a lot is uh, um, by Peter Dahlgren, who is a, a Scandinavian theoretician. And he distinguishes, it's maybe also interesting for us here, is the, the structural, the representational and the interactional uh, dimension of the public sphere. And the structural dimension being uh, the media ecology, so everything related to um, media legislation um, um, by governments, by different governments, uh, the representational dimension, the media output, which we have talked already a lot about here in the academy, and the interactional, the day-to-day -day interaction. So, uh, after this background, conceptual theoretical background that I hope was not too boring. Um, we come to analyzing hashtags. And um, what you, ah, there's a spelling mistake, it's hashtagging the invisible. Um, you could call, actually what, ha what has happened uh, or what, what happens with uh, feminist uh, mobilizations via hashtag um, goes back to a tradition um, of the second wave of uh, feminist movements in the, in the Western world, in Europe, uh, which was the slogan, the private is political. Um, and now we can see somehow a development there. It's like the publici publicizing the private is uh, at the forefront. It's like, this is not a private matter. This is not um, something that only happens to me um, by sharing what uh, your everyday experience, you can actually connect in a counter public um, with others, um, not only women, but also men uh, who joined in um, um, uh, speaking about their experiencing, experiences that were considered before private or were privatized. And privatizing a matter is very political as well, you know, saying we don't talk about this here, this got nothing to do. Um, uh, with this. And then we come back sh actually back to the very uh, core idea of uh, Habermas. You remember the, uh, the old theoretician who's, by the way, still alive and sometimes uh, and, uh, um, giving some interventions, um, especially with regards to the European Union, um, who said uh, this, the, the public sphere should always be there to challenge 
the state and state and state authorities and giving new ideas um, uh, and also rectifying sometimes uh, uh, courses. So I think this can be very well still linked to this, this very old idea of the public sphere in the first place. Um, yeah, but let's get back to some uh, very practical tools when you see uh, new feminist hashtags uh, arising, what do you do? Or like, for instance, any uh, hashtag. Um, it's what I call the genesis of uh, feminist hashtags. You can ask, okay, what has happened? How, what was at the beginning? What, was, what, what triggered that um, movement online? And we heard already uh, um, for the Me Too um, hashtag, the question of uh, Alisa Milano has been uh, named as the one who launched that hashtag, and it was about a very specific case in Hollywood. Um, it can also be, and this is what I would then uh, frame as a prominent incident, it can also be part of the wider movement. So for example, you have already a movement uh, on the ground, and then they organize also online. Um, or it can also be a reaction to media coverage, or to, uh, to mass media coverage. Uh, coverage. Um, so, what I would like to show you now is a little movie, a little film. And um, also to show you, uh, get to my next idea, we've heard, okay, it's Alisa Milano, uh, this very prominent actress, white, beautiful actress. Um, but indeed, um, hash, uh, Me Too, the idea, the concept of sharing oppressed, uh, exper the experience of the oppressed, uh, comes from uh, Tarana Burke, who's actually, um, uh, a black woman uh, from the U.S. who has worked with, uh, especially with uh, young kids uh, of uh, 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 working class backgrounds and um, uh, living in bad uh, conditions. So uh, it has been also recognized and Alisa Milano has recognized and said, yes, uh, I'm sorry, she was actually first. But this shows also the, how the racist uh, system in the media plays out where she gets the attention and, uh, but we will now uh, look at what Tarana Boka has to say. When you go through something as traumatic as sexual violence, there's a way that you close up. Your protection, the way you protect yourself, it's like you're shrouded in shame. And the disclosure, not just the disclosure, but then the subsequent having somebody else connect with you and say, you're not alone in that, it just frees you. It frees you from the shame. You don't have to give the details, because the details really don't matter. If somebody is bold and stands up and tells their story and you're not ready to do that and that's not where you are in your journey, to just simply say Me Too is powerful but it's soft. Me Too can be a conversation starter or it can be the whole conversation. Okay. Does anybody uh, wants to resume uh, what she said? Any ideas about that? What are her important points? Of the found, founder, founder of uh, Me Too. Yes, Naomi? I think what she's saying is that um, women lived, uh, lo women were harassed, and it's difficult to speak up about it, that a hashtag can actually help to share, to, to see that you're not alone, and it happened to other women, and when she's saying that Me Too can be uh, the start of a conversation or the whole conversation, I think she's saying that actually, if you don't want to talk about it, but you still want to share to not feel alone, it's enough to just say Me Too, and you don't need to say more because people know what it is about. Exactly. Some more ideas you want to share? No? Uh, there is an idea, okay, please. Salam, sabah al khair, bin jami. Ana ma atakad ano hi hakat kitir afkar hu wadha jidda min afkar li zakaratha. Walakin akan al ibda' fi haza al mawdu ano al musharaka wa al taatuf bi absat al suwar wa al ladi yahfaz al khususiyya. وبشكل إيجابي والشغلة الأخيرة اللي بدي أحكيها إنه ممكن الذكور يشاركوا في هذا الموضوع كمان ما كان خاص بالإناث 
لما يشعر الشخص مع الاخر انه ممكن يحكي مي تو ممكن مش هو شخصيا ولكن بقصه صارت مع احد اقاربه كمان وشكرا Yes, yes, yeah, definitely. That was what I also said earlier. It's like not only a women's movement, definitely. Okay, you have one last and then we continue. طبعا ما ما يميز هذا الفيديو انه بورينا كيف انه وسائل التواصل الاجتماعي احدث الثوره حقيقيه ومجله التايم بعام 2017 كتبت مقال انه هاي اسرع حركه تغيير نسائي كانت بالعام 2017. والدليل على ذلك انه حجم الانتشار الواسع اللي شمل كل ارجاء العالم وشكرا. Yes. I come back to that uh, time cover later. So. <laughs> uh, yeah, what I want to stress as well uh, is that she's saying something important with regards to um, also digital security, what I said before. It's like uh, if you participate, do it also in a, in a reflected way. You don't have to share everything because there might be also backlash in your private life, you know? Um, what you do online can have real repercussions of your, of your life offline. So be careful. Um, uh, take what you need um, from, from, that, from that hashtag and feel the solidarity, but also always protect yourself in your everyday life. So. Don't blindly use the media without thinking about the repercussions. So, uh, where I wanted to already hint to before is like I work with intersectional theory. So that basically means um, um, it has been developed very much from um, um, black feminist scholars in the United States, um, pointing out that actually uh, it's not only about gender relations um, that define our, um, our society and, this, and the sexist system that somehow defines our world and how we live and how we work, um, but also capitalism uh, with regards to class and racism, so with, regard, with regards to race. So you always, the, 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 tr the typical triangle is always uh, um, um, race, class and gender that needs to be looked at as an intersecting uh, structure of oppression, right? So for example, what we've just seen, we had a white actress that is somehow at the forefront and the, giving the image of the Me Too movement, but actually it was uh, uh, Madame Burke uh, who uh, worked on this uh, also long before. So um, there's also reactions to this, um, um, reflecting a bit this interlocking system of oppression. Uh, for example, Not Your Asian Sidekick um, points out how hashtags can be used as a tool of decolonized practice. Um, these were uh, mostly also women and, um, of Asian origin, I think also in the, in the United States mostly, uh, saying how they are being uh, affected very differently uh, from patriarchal culture. And that's also what we talked about before. I mean, religion and gender um, uh, is also a very important intersection that you can look at because women have very different experiences, uh, also depending on the context, right? Um, and the same is to uh, the Me Too uh, hashtag is an example from the, from the German context um, that collects experiences of racism and discrimination. Um, just also to point out that intersecting um, uh, structure of oppression. So it's endless. Okay, um, I would like to go back uh, a little bit to theory uh, that can be helpful um, by Mira Marx Ferré. Uh, she, um, her theory or her concept of soft repression stems from 2004 but it can very well, I think, also explain what happens online. Um, she says, um, gender-based movements uh, may not um, be attacked by state authorities or be illegalized or criminalized like that, but there is something which she called hard repression. There's something called soft repression that functions on a different level. And uh, here, ridicule, stigma, and silencing um, are like the, the main pillars of this uh, soft repression, which I think also for us studying media literacy is very interesting because um, she shows, for example, ridiculing a woman or uh, uh, stigmatizing a group, uh, functioning via images, via uh, wrong citations, decontextualizations, 
um, can lead to a soft repression. Um, and when we look at uh, uh, hashtags, I don't know um, if you analyze them a little bit more in detail and also in the in, into history, um, you can notice something that I, what I call a hijacking hashtags. And these hijacks uh, function a little bit in the same way like offline, you know? So for example, ridiculing, so um, tweets uh, are being responded and uh, ridiculed um, by, let's just call them trolls, let's not put any gender on it, it's just like some uh, trolls from the society. Um, derailing, uh, what also happens is individualization, um, for instance with uh, Harvey Weinstein, who was at the beginning of this Me, Me Too movement, um, you had the, <clears throat> you saw that it's, and also in the, in, the, in the German context, you can notice the same. Um, it's very much always recurring to the individual. That is an individual man. That was an individual incident, right? Um, in order not to, to ignore the actual the structure that is behind it, the structure of oppression. So <clears throat> what also happens very often is uh, pushing political agendas. So you would, for example, also see then accounts um, of uh, sexual harassment decont being decontextualized and put into another, uh, for example, political parties that, are, uh, that have their own agenda, um, that uh, want to make politics uh, with the movement and exploit, um, exploit this kind of movement. Victimization is also something that, uh, that you see very much as a response uh, in, in these hashtags, for example. Uh, one example is the, is the hashtag, not all men. Um, it's like, um, and actually it's, this is victimization but also individualization because nobody ever said it's all men, you know? It's like you're trying to point out a structure um, that enables uh, a certain uh, uh, oppression and behavior. Um, so it's not all men. If you're not one of these men, that's perfect. So join in, you know, in the Me Too, as you, as you mentioned earlier. Um, and yeah, simple trolling for the attention. Um, as soon as, you know, as soon as there is something trending, there's just also people coming in, joining in with their own, maybe also very individual agenda, or just for the lulz, just to have fun um, uh, hijacking these movements. And here, we come also back to uh, Jürgen Habermas. Um, what I just uh, showed with the, with the hashtags uh, uh, hijack. Um, so what Habermas uh, describes uh, in general as the modus operandi also in, the, in our mass mediated uh, society where he distinguishes uh, four core elements that lead somehow also to a, a, a mood of anti-politics and a depolitization um, of, uh, uh, of, our, of, of, of citizens, um, and uh, I will just read it here, where issues of political discourse become assimilated into and absorbed by the modes and contents of entertainment, um, which is the personalization, we talked about this, uh, Harvey Weinstein functions, it's clear, it's one person, it's also a powerful person, the dramatization of events, the simplification of complex matters, this got also to do like, for example, with the intersectional theory, right? It's like, um, uh, and the vivid polarization uh, of conflict promotes civic privatism and the mood of anti-politics. So I think um, what he states here for this also more mass mediated uh, societies also is valid or it can be reflected um, and transferred to uh, hashtag publics. I will now show you a short video um, to give uh, an example of how you could, or how uh, um, artist uh, collectives have uh, tried to react to this kind of um, hijacking of hashtags. So for example, if a profile would um, use specific keywords, um, um, they programmed their algorithm to detect these uh, uh, keywords and then would send a bot as, an, as a response uh, um, that you will see here that is a program uh, of uh, anti-sexism so to help 
uh, the, these uh, profiles or these men to overcome um, their, um, their own sexism. So it's like a little bit in a funny way, but it also shows how you can also use new technologies or the technologies to respond and also somehow go against uh, the, this, this hijacking of, of hashtags. Sexism. Now, online, this can manifest itself in a number of ways. For example, being completely unaware of your privilege, starting arguments with, this is not about gender, but in situations where you feel threatened, or have people backing you up, you might start using female body parts as insults, or threats of violence. To shut people up. Twitter has no idea what to do about this kind of behavior. But I can cure you. I will cure you. All of you. The first step is to own your behavior and challenge your denial instinct. I will tell myself that I'm just expressing my opinion. That it was my right. Or that women we're just using the fact that they were born with a vagina to get attention or sympathy. Denial I suggest itself up in all sorts of things. Yeah, I didn't want to show you the, the whole video. Um, but just give you an idea how creatively you can somehow um, uh, react here and uh, enroll uh, the trolls uh, in their, in their self-helping uh, program, I find this uh, uh, very helpful. So I think there are also four steps um, online and um, uh, it has been, that has been realized by the Peng Collective. Uh, I think they're based in, in Berlin. So um, let's talk about more again about this, um, about the spillovers from counterpublics to the mainstream. You have, oh, where are you? There you are. Uh, mentioned the, the Time magazine cover um, that has indeed, for example, also then taken um, this very prominent, most prominent uh, hashtag MeToo and um, called it the silence breakers, the voices that launched a movement. What you see here again is also like uh, about in, in this cover, I mean, you are more way better than me in the making a visual analysis, uh, but what you see is that there is a place somehow also missing, so meaning that actually everybody is also part of this, or can be part of this voice. Um, what you see is that, of course, Sarana Burke is not represented, but I mean, this is not what it is about. Um, but it's also interesting to have it as a person of the year with regards also to the personification. Uh, um, as, as a way of then also not really talking that the person is again in the, in the forefront, not the, the, the structure um, that, the, that these women actually would um, point out. Another example is uh, here from The Guardian, an illustration that I find uh, uh, found very telling, shows also how the discourse also was um, uh, developed, uh, it's about men after me too, this illustration. And I think I would just uh, like to have some uh, of your opinions. What do you think about this illustration? How does it show, uh, how has the discourse developed? Like, wh what does it show? What do you think about it? Are there any ideas? Up here? Up there? أم أم بتخيل في مشكلة شوي بخطاب ميتو بشكل عام إنه أحيانا 
بتجهل كثير امور منطقيه ولها علاقه ب خصوصيات المجتمعات احيانا بالظروف الاقتصاديه آه ما بيعرف انه في بعض الظروف هي مش جندريه بقدر ما هي ظروف عامه ممكن تكون على كلا الجندرين بنفس الوقت يعني ما بتتعلق بمجتمع آه او بجندر في مجتمع معين آه بت يعني بتخيل نوعيه الكاريكاتير هذا ممكن هي افضل مثال على هذا الموضوع انه في كثير خطاب من مي من من كثير ناس مشاركين بميتو كان حاد جدا لدرجة انه ازعج الناس بطريقة سيئة جدا مع انه يفترض انه يكسب الناس لطرف ممكن انا عكس اللي شلان حكيه بجوز انا احيانا انا بشوف انه الصدمة بتولد بتولد احيانا بتصحي فالصدمه اللي عملتها هاشتاج ميتو احيانا عن جد لما ندخل على المواضيع اللي لها دخل بالجندر والاشياء اللي لها دخل بحقوق المراه والطفل وهي الاشياء بنلاقي انه لازم يكون في صدمات معينه عم عم بتلقاها المجتمع ليصحى شوي من من الغيبوبه اللي هو موجود فيها ذاتس اول ثانك يو اوكي ان هير واز ذا لاست You asked us about the, the picture. Mm-hmm. You asked you asked us about this picture, right? So I think that this picture throws that um, respecting women is compulsory. It is not a choice. So uh, also teaching this picture shows also that uh, teaching the new generation of men is also very important. This is a lesson for every man. Plus, women in media uh, must be uh, not only an example to another woman, it must be uh, like uh, a teacher of uh, values. So it's very essential to, uh, to know this. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very interesting, definitely. I mean, what it showed also, it, um, it, this represents also a bit the trigger of the debate around masculinities, around men. Right, what we've just also seen here, which is also very important, opening a space about what what has this actually done to me? How do I, uh, what do I do now with these privileges? You sp- spoke about uh, the family and the next generation and educating young men um, or and boys that might not suffer like this, because I mean we here see here an illustration of a, of a man who's like suffering from his masculinity. He doesn't know. Uh, it's a, it's. You said trauma, that was the translation. I would, I'm kind of, um, I guess it's not that, uh, what was the Arabic word? It was, uh, for the, for trauma? That's what, okay. It's interesting, because I think this is very important because of the, the nuance, to get the nuance here. Um, so anyway, so uh, what we see is, of course, also it's a debate that has been triggered online on the, with different hashtags, but that has been then that spilled over into mass media and also then somehow affected the whole society. And uh, as you said, I also want to pick up your point again uh, about uh, 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 women in the media as a... As a um, as um, as an example, um, and what we what we also know about different media sectors, uh, I, I know for the for the Arab world there has been studies, but also uh, in general, even though there are more and more also female reporters and journalists, when it comes to the production side, when it comes to the heads of media houses, they are still very male dominated. So it's also like in the near future, in the next three four years, I'm not sure if there will be any like huge changes, unless you really uh, work on awareness and the waking up, the wake up call that uh, has been mentioned earlier um, in, in the different, in the, in the media houses as well. Another uh, example of uh, spilling over is for example, and here in the, mm, uh, in the real space is the harass map that has been um, uh, invented and launched by also uh, Egyptian activists Mm, where they would show uh, from <clears throat> in the city of Cairo, for example, but you see this also in 
very uh, uh, in cities now all over the world, where women uh, who have encountered sexual harassment industries, which is a huge uh, problem also in Egypt, um, that they would like uh, put that on a map. So uh, here you can really see the spillover uh, uh, of online uh, raising awareness to the public space, uh, the, the public space in the city. So the urban space. So, um, after having uh, spoken now about the, the, the positive outcomes, like uh, the, the impact that it had with regards to the mass media, with regards to triggering uh, a broader soci societal discourse, uh, also like pretty much all over the world. I mean, also there are hashtags now in India that has been, for example, launched after uh, Me Too. Um, we should also always uh, keep in mind the vulnerabilities. Um, just as a resume, we spoke about hijacks, hijacking the hashtags. Um, we also need, I mean, to keep in mind how the development in the, in the future will be more and more uh, um, into algorithmic uh, editing. And I'm teaching also IT students and computer engineers in Berlin, and most of them are men. And uh, I think it's also very important to make those aware that are coding our realities right now, uh, right now about uh, give them some input into uh, our uh, into our society and political uh, power structures. So because otherwise we are ingraining sexist um, um, and also. Uh, racist editings in the algorithms that are defining our world, right? Um, what we've also seen is once a message is out, um, there is no control over the content anymore. You don't know how it can be used. I will give you one example from Taharosh. Um, why Taharosh was maybe, was very important maybe in the uh, Arabophone um, discourse. Um, also getting a, a name, getting a word for what many women are experiencing. Um, in the German context, as this word uh, has been used and instrumentalized by the right wing. Who would say, like you would find this in the uh, in right wing uh, news media saying Taharosh is a, a kind of sexual harassment that only the Arab men do. So. Um, this is an example of how uh, uh, actually an emancipatory movement that f uh, also found a wording um, to connect and find uh, empathy and find strength can be instrumentalized in another political context uh, for their uh, gains, which is yeah, racist, uh, racist, uh, racist point. Um, yeah, there is a, there's the concept of multi-layered visibilities, which has also got a little bit to do with what Tarana Burke was saying before. Don't share everything. Share what you feel you are ready to share as well. Because once you're out, you're also giving uh, a visibility to yourself, to your profile, to your life. And this can be, on the one hand, helpful, because there are other um, people who join in and you get solidarity. But on the other hand, it also can be a visibility that is harmful and you can be attacked. <coughs> and last but not least, uh, the lack of inclusivity and intersectionality uh, is, is very, is of course very important. We still live in a, uh, uh, in a, in a world with uh, global inequalities and these are also affected with regards to access to technologies. So you also always have to keep in mind, okay, who actually has the time, who has the resources and the technologies, the internet um, to participate in this counter public. So actually again, uh, when you remember uh, the, the different theoreticians that were criticizing each other and always revising the theory, we could also, of course, go uh, argue here um, that these feminist hashtag publics that we've discussed so far are also very much elitist in a way as they are all uh, literate, media literate uh, uh, people more or less and have access to these resources. So there is definitely also exclusions um, that you have to keep in mind and that make also movements vulnerable. So, um, but my last uh, interactive question here today would be, uh, what do you think, in maybe also your context, uh, where you're from, your community, somebody was mentioning your community that needs to be more, fo more focused on. Um, <coughs> 
more in focus. Um, what are the impacts and the social change that you feel or that you would state with regards maybe also to university, to the media, um, into in your, uh, in, uh, with regards to other editors maybe that you're working with, has there, has there been some changes? لا احنا في الاردن يعني صارت يعني كثير توعيه بخصوص هذا الموضوع لدرجه انهم زودوها يعني صار الموضوع مبالغ فيه شويه حتى في بعض المنظمات اصبحت تلجا لانه تعطي ارقام مش صحيحه عن التحرش بس احنا الامور عندنا يعني ما بحس انه كثير امتحان اكيد راح يعترضوا طبعا مليان بس احنا انا برايي كايه ما عندنا الارقام كثير مبالغ فيها بس في عندنا مشكله في في تعريف التحرش يعني اصبح التعريف كثير واسع مش محدد بالضبط وعندنا في قانون بيمنعه وفي عليه عقوبات يعني مدرجه فيه بس بشكل عام لا احنا يعني هي هي يعني الحمله هاي يعني اعطت وعي كثير كبير عندنا فخف خف الموضوع كثير بس مش مبالغ فيه ما عندنا شيء كثير مبالغ Uh, here and then here in the middle. Okay. Uh, but sorry, Aya. But so far, we are in the Jordan. We have no, I mean, the rules of the law. So we don't have to worry about it. You are going to be punished. No, it's not. 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 يعني مش بالمعنى الثاني هو حدا يمسكك انت هتك تعرضي انت مسك جسمي شيء خاص فيه يعني فاحنا بنروح على هذا المكان فبالقانون الاردني ما في عندنا تجريم للتحرش الارقام مضلله لانه اصلا احنا ما بصير عندنا تبليغ على هذا الموضوع واصلا ولا في رقم في كل العالم هو بيقدر يقيس لك التحرش لانه التحرش حتى عالميا لسه في عليه اشكاليه شو هو طيب ما هو التحرش انا شخص بنئذي اذا حدا حكى لي ما شاء الله مثلا أنا بنئذي وبعتبره متحرش أنت تحمل مساحتي الخاصة بس في شخص ثاني تمام عادي فهو كمان برضه كيف كل شخص بتلقى شيء معين بس هاي هي ثانك يو أي ثينك يو ور فيرست أند ذن سكند يس شكرا uh, أنا بدي أحكي الأرقام مش مضللة بس هي الأرقام مشوهة يعني سبعين بالمية نسبة التحرش انت بتعطي اتهام للمجتمع بشكل كبير انه شو مجتمع متحرش يعني اصبحت النظره تحرش مرحبا في بعض الناس بيعتبرها تحرش وهذا الشيء بالاردن صار جدا مبالغ فيه بشكل يعني مزعج جدا وللاسف انا طلبت يعني مراكز الدراسات المعتمده باجراء دراسات عن الموضوع حتى بصعب حصر فئات او تعريف التحرش باجمالا بصعب عليهم حصر فئات نوعية التحرش الحاصل فيبدو هناك في تمويلات خارجية بتدعم الموضوع بشكل مشوه للصورة العامة في المجتمع شكرا يعني بجوز بدي أحكي شيء ما بعرف إذا أفهم صح ولا لا لكن أنا برجع على مسألة أن مفهوم التحرش أو مصلح التحرش إحنا مش معرفينه بطريقة صحيحة إذا بدي أرجع من ثلاثين سنة أو من أربعين سنة في الله خلقنا ذكر وأنثى في شيء اسمه مغازلة في شيء اسمه معاكسة كانت البنت إذا بتطلع بالشارع وما حدا بطلع عليها بكون في مشكلة لأنه الله خلقنا هيك هلا أنا بالتأكيد ضد مبدأ التحرش واقتحام خصوصية الآخر لكن لازم إحنا يكون في عندنا تعريف صحيح بين وتفريق بين مسألة إنه أنا شايف الصبية هاي جميلة فأنا بدي أتقرب منها أعاكسها أغازلها المحببة اللي هي تتقبلها مني وبين بين إنه أنا أقتحم خصوصية Okay, I think I got I got your point. There is one last, and then I think we have to. You were also you also want to say okay. If we have time. I just want to hear many voices, right? <laughs> okay. Claudia, please. Uh, I mean, 
speak in Arabic, so I guess it's easier. Maybe, maybe in English. I know about the definition. No, definition. تعريف أنا بعطيك تعريف للتحرش أنا إنسانة جسدي لإلي ما حدا بحقله أوكي يطلع فيه أو يعني يعطي ملاحظة ولا لأني بنت ولا لأن بدي حدا يتغزل فيه ولا شيء كل واحد عنده حريته وزيت الشيء للشباب أنا ما بقول بس كبنت يعني كمان الشاب بيصير في تحرش ضد الشباب كمان يعني الشاب كمان لازم يكون عنده مين ما كان إنسان شو ما كان شاب بنت ولا شو ما كان لازم يكون عنده حرية الهو مين وما حدا بحقله ولا لأن حدا خلقان بشي زيادة أو ناقص بحقله يطلع فيه ويفكر أنه نحن لأن مجتمعنا هيك بدنا نقدم بعدين سبعين بالمية يمكن قليل نطلع على التسعين أكيد كمان ما هون الغلط لأن الناس بيفكروا أنه شو ما لازم إذا واحد ما وصل للريب مثل ما كان حدا عم بيقول قبل ما وصل للاغتصاب مثلا يعني هيدا مش تحرش مش مزبوط تحرش وقت حدا عم 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 يتلقى شيء ما بده إياه هيدا هو التحرش شيء ما بده إياه ما عم يتلقى okay okay thank you I see now there is a real discussion going on I'm not sure if me in my lecture I can handle this because I'm a scientist but I find this very important that you guys um, meet yourself, meet and speak about this, you know, because we've seen there are definitions. I just have two comments. Um, on the one hand, it's important to um, point out the legislation because when it comes to the criminal courts, we have a similar, um, I mean, this is also what I've said, um, we have also uh, adoption of new legislation on sexual violence. This is uh, the last point that I mentioned, that has been mentioned here. Um, in the German case, there was also a new legislation actually defining sexual harassment um, in the streets. The same is true for the, for the, in Tunisia, for example. Now Jordan, I've heard that there are still also, uh, there, there is lacking actually the uh, criminalization. Okay, but and uh, it's like in the process, but of course definitions are very important when it comes also to criminal uh, matters um, and uh, to, to legislations. Um, what you said with regards to flirting and the development of flirting, what uh, uh, um, Dr. Claudia now uh, uh, nicely put uh, or gave an, uh, an, an, a new definition maybe also of harassment is um, 30 years ago, where were 30 years ago, were there many women in the public sphere able to participate in this discourse that I mentioned before? I think you can definitely also uh, show what I showed with the, with the theory. Uh, at the beginning, it was a white man who was defining this is public sphere theory and this is how uh, it should be in an ideal world. We keep away, uh, let uh, uh, um, aside our differences and discuss the rational argument. Nancy Fraser needed to come. Uh, other uh, uh, scholars needed to come and challenge. And I think it's more or less also the same idea as comes with the social definitions of what is flirting, uh, what is harassment, uh, that also women themselves start to define. It's not men who say, but I was just flirting with you, you know? Depends on who is the person that defines. And now we are shifting also with many to many media that enable um, to give uh, voices to the many uh, and able people who were not participating in the discourse before giving their definition, giving their reality. So this is about redistributing also power and the power of the definition. Okay. Um, um, I think uh, I will just give you also some more power uh, and let you speak. Um, But please use your power wisely. Um, yeah, sure. Um, but I think that the problem is 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 في the problem is that 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 فكان مساحة الحوار الموجودة فوضوية أكثر منها بناء يعني ما كان في اقتراحات عملية وفعالة لتعزيز المرأة بمجتمعاتنا 
يعني زي ما حكت ربا احنا لحد هلا ما عندنا تعريف للتحرش بالقانون الاردني يعني هو فعل غير مجرم بالقانون الاردني فلو يتم صياغه خطاب بحسب كل مجتمع وتحديات الاقتصاديه والاجتماعيه بيكون افضل كثير من انه ينحكى بس بشكل عام عن الـ 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 يعني الانتهاكات اللي بتتعرض لها المراه شكرا اوكي سو هير 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 اند ذن هير اند ذن وي كلوز ات يعني اولا كل الشيء اللي حكوا الزملاء في هذا الموضوع يعني صحيح و لكن انا بحب اركز دائما على كيف بدنا نسوي التغيير، يعني التغيير جزء ببعض الدول العربيه بلش يظهر على الساحه لكن ما بلبي طموحاتنا بخصوص قضيه التحرش بالذات. ليش؟ لانه هي قضيه جدليه وشيء بيدخل بالقانون وعادات وتقاليد ومجتمعات شرقيه والى الى ما ذلك، لكن انا بشوف اذا اليوم بدنا نعرف انه في عندنا تغيير في هذا الموضوع فلازم نركز على شو المحتوى الاعلامي اللي بيقدم في هذا الموضوع، احنا اليوم عم نشوف ناس تشتغل بحملات ضد التحرش تبذل جهد مجرد ما انتهت الحمله بيرجع بتتذكر البيئه اللي هو فيها، لانه حتى الاعلام قديش بتنا... قديش حاجه بتناول قضايا التحرش بالاعلام ضئيل جدا. بال... على المستوى الاخر عم... يتم استخدام الانثى كمبرر للتحرش في في مختلف وسائل الاعلام من خلال الاعلانات يعني بكون سبيل المثال اعلان مستحضر ذكوري للرجال لازم يدخلوا الانثى فيه، لانه مجرد ما استخدموا مرق من جنب البنت غمزها اشر لها أعجبت فيه صارت صديقة له فأنا برأيك أشوف أنه التغيير بعيداً عن القانون بعيداً عن الجدلية في المجتمعات سواء غربية أو عربية لازم نركز على المحتوى الإعلامي اللي يكون فيه خطاب مضاد لخطاب التحرش لأنه الفكر يحارب بالفكر What I understood now is also you're pointing out uh, the, uh, that there needs to be more awareness also in um, Uh, in uh, advertising and advertisement and in the media houses in general. Yes, I think also that this is definitely uh, one, of the, one of the outcomes, I would say. Um, okay, next. Okay. I just want to share some of the information that I talked about a little bit. There is a group in the Urdu called Tadamun, and it works as a group of women in the Urdu. It's a group. ومعهم معهم مجموعه من الباحثين والمحامين طلعوا مثلا بورقه بحثيه او اسمها التحرش الجنسي في الاردن ورقه حقائق 11 16 بدكم انكم تقراوها موجوده اعتقد بتحكي عن القوانين بقانون العقوبات تعدلت كثير قوانين لها دخل ب مثلا مرتكبي جريمه المداعب واللي هي انترجت تحت التحرش اخر شيء بدي احكي لكم اياه على موضوع بس انه انخفض التحرش بالاردن بالعكس اداره المعلومات الجنائيه في الاردن بتحكي العكس انه من عام 2015 وطالع زاد التحرش بالضبط جمعيه تضامن الدراسه اللي عندها ب 2017 في 145 جريمه اغتصاب هو معدل حوالي اغتصاب كل يومين 138 جريمه اغتصاب عام 2016 122 جريمه عام 2015 1100 جريمة هتك عرض بعام 2017 كمان ففي أرقام موجودة وفي أرقام تحكي إنه في إن حالات تحرش وحالات اغتصاب وحالات هتك عرض لكن المصادر هي موجودة عندكم دراسات موجودة إذا بدكم تقدر تأخذوها وتروح لا لا من لسه عم بحكي لك في اكثر لا لانه الحكي انخفض العكس اللي عم بيصير الجرائم المسجله هي بارتفاع مش بانخفاض ثانك يو فور وات اي ناو تيك فروم هير يور بوينتينج اوت ذير از ان اورجانيزيشن ذات هاز دون ريسيرش اند يو انفايتد ذا اذرز تو اولسو لوك ات اب ويتش از اولويز فيري اتس جريت تو اولسو شير ريسورسز اباوت ذا ايشو بيكوز ذير ار اوف كورس اكسبيرتس ذات هاف ذات ار وركينج اون ات اتس نوت جست ا ميديا Um, uh, or, or a hashtag phenomena, it has also real repercussions. And of course, there's also more funding maybe because you were pointing, I know where you wanted to go with your comment. Um, but thankfully, there is also more funding for research on these issues. And this uh, is, uh, is true for all over the world. But still, it's underfunded, underfunded everywhere. Um, okay, do you want to say something directly to him? Yalla. Hello. إدارة المعلومات إدارة المعلومات الجنائية فعلاً بتسجل الشكاوى اللي بتوصلها 
حول الاغتصاب والتحرش او هتك العرض تمام تطلع الارقام عاليه بجمعيه تضامن تنشر الارقام هاي وتحكي ضمن تقريرها هي جمعيه تضامن هي جمعيه يعني موضوعيه تذكر ضمن التقرير انه هاي شكاوى وردت اداره المعلومات الجنائيه هي مجرد شكاوى لم يبت فيها بعد بعد حوالي تقريبا هي القضايا بتوقف فتره من ست اشهر لسنه المحكمه الجنايات او المحكمه المختصه في هذا الامر لحتى اكون دقيقه اكثر بتطلع الارقام شو شو اللي تم الفصل فيه من 137 شكوى اغتصاب تمت الادانه في ثمانيه فقط منها لانه في منها تم ما كانت الادله كافيه منها كانت شكاوى كيديه لحد ومنها اكتشفوا انها تكون العلاقه بيناتهم هي علاقه حب بتجبره برفع شكوى الاغتصاب على الزواج منها او انه مثلا وعدها بالزواج وتخلى عنها باخر لحظه بترفع عليه قضيه الاغتصاب او في منها شكاوى تقدم متاخره فبالتالي ما بصير الاعتبار اوكي فهو فعليا الارقام هاي مش صحيحه اوكي اوكي ثانك يو فور ذا كلاريفيكيشن بس اتس اولسو اجين You know, um, a question of, I was talking here about structures. What is happening here now is again, a kind of a derailment saying, oh, but these statistics are fraud and these are funding them. And it's actually the imperialist agenda that is behind it. You know, this is kind of a very also, it's like an, uh, a derailment when it's about personalization, when we actually speak about uh, structures, you know, um, and an individualization. But um, what we talked about now is, um, that there needs to, or there is maybe also more literacy on the issue of violence against women in general, also in the media and in the media houses. Um, there has been new concepts being introduced, such as the harush, which didn't exist before, and that has been exploited positively and negatively, also by the, for example, by right-wing uh, forces. Um, and, but in general, and I think this, this discussion showed it as well, there is more space and more room to, uh, and more awareness also to discuss uh, everyday sexist behavior from definitions to new legislations to reports, um, which is important. Um, what I also would like to say uh, on, the, on the meta level, so to say, and then I will finish, um, is uh, the long-term changes um, that are, that we are, that these, Hashtags are there to encounter also conservative backlashes and sexist rollbacks. I mean, maybe we would have not expected that there would be a uh, US president who can publicly and, and very mediatized speak about sexual harassment like he clearly uh, outed himself when you say, you know, I don't want to repeat it, but he uh, um, outed himself as a harasser basically and he still got elected. Um, uh, showing that actually we really need this uh, movement, but on the other hand, there are also the rollbacks, and uh, they are also very, very strong. They are uh, in the White House right now. Um, but also on the long hand, there's also the renegotiation of gender roles, what we've seen with the, um, with the illustration from The Guardian and what has been discussed here, okay, and here, what is actually the role of the family uh, uh, in the tradition of uh, raising and uh, educating um, boys, young men, um, and their behavior. What, how, uh, how can they, uh, how can they have a meaningful part also in the society? Um, deconstruct toxic masculinities. This is also a concept that is now very uh, got very famous in the uh, in, in the gender studies discourse, um, where it's, uh, where we would not only focus about how women are, for instance, suffering. Um, and uh, portraying women always as the victim and men always as the perpetrator, but actually it's about toxic behavior um, that can, and I think here again, uh, c coming back to the definition, simple definition from uh, uh, Dr. Claudia Cosman before, whenever you invade my space in a form that I don't want to, this is like, can be considered kind of a, a sexual harassment or a harassment in more general terms. And um, if we all agree um, that we respect uh, each other and respect the boundaries of each other, uh, that this could make maybe also a better world. But um, I, I think this is uh, what has been started by, uh, for example, uh, by these hashtags. 
And last but not least, as a political scientist, I have to say, I think in the end, this contributes to a more peaceful society and also demilitarization because sexual harassment and the military, so for instance, uh, militaries are very strong patriarchal uh, institutions. Um, and I'm waiting for the hashtag that is also actually calling out uh, this kind of uh, sexual uh, um, behavior, for instance, in the, in the military, for, in, uh, for example. Um, just to see, okay, we have seen here how media have challenged uh, power relations, very ingrained power relations in a society, have showed uh, different solidarity, have created solidarities across the ocean. And um, yeah, I think it's a very good uh, example also to study uh, different layers of, of media literacy. And now it's also on, on us to see what we're doing with it in our own profession and in our life. Thank you. Thank you.